suspect you'll be making good use of that as the semester goes on. But just as a reminder, that's an important material. And even if I come in, you should still plan to continue to uh, push forward on talking about the project. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to finish up a discussion of the best uh, practices, uh, sort of whirlwind, and then start going into um, the area of requirement solicitation, which is going to be a significant concern for you in the near future with Dr. Wabha, uh, with with your with your uh, stakeholder. Okay. Um, last time I had talked quite a bit about testing. Um, I'm going to touch on a few points of that now uh, that uh, I didn't really get a chance to talk about. One of them is the point, and I don't know why this is so whacked out color-wise, but um, uh, within the testing context, we have different unit, different levels of test. And I mentioned this and alluded to it and, and used the terminology, but I just wanted to, to make sure that this sinks in in terms of how they relate to different levels of development. I mean, Broadly speaking, um, we have low-level coding and design corresponding to unit tests. So unit tests validate or verify this, uh, this sort of low-level testing. So you might, might write a unit test for a method, for example. You might even, in some cases, write unit tests for, for classes, where um, why would you write a unit test for a class if you have unit tests uh, for each method in the class? Do you have to write a unit test uh, for the class? Well, sometimes there's issues that aren't, they don't reduce to one method being given, you know, sort of information um, uh, passed in as parameters, for example, and, and seeing if it returns a certain value or what have you. Um, rather, what it involves is different methods, how they play together nicely. So the obvious example is you push and you pop, right? You, you make sure you push and something onto the stack and you pop, you get that thing back. It's not reduced, it's not necessarily just a test of one method, it's a test that the class, the different parts of the class functionality, the different methods work together nicely, okay? And we do have unit tests sometimes at that level. The next level up, well we often have them at the level of classes, the next level up is uh, concerns where you might have several classes working together. Give me a, a thing I, I would have hoped you would have seen in 470 or 370 um, where you have multiple uh, classes working together. Did you discuss any patterns or architectural patterns uh, in those classes? Observer pattern? Yeah, the observer pattern, right? You have something that's being observed and something that's being notified when that observed thing is being changed, right? There's many other examples like this. Uh, for example, in the pipe and filter model, you have, you have different uh, types of, of uh, filters and pipes that might interchangeably work together. And you gotta make sure they play together nicely. Um, model view controller, right? You have, you have a model representing kind of the underlying state of the, of the system or of the domain part of the system. You have a view which captures, well, what does a view capture? You tell me. What is, what's the purpose of a view? Changes, it captures changes from the model. That's right, and reflects them um, visually, right? And what does the controller do? Uh, the controller um, makes changes to the model, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It makes changes to the model in response often to what's happening in the view. Yeah, user requests, clicking, button pushes, you know, um, uh, things with the, the keystrokes, whatever. So, so the point here is we have pieces of a program that have to work together. It's not just one class in isolation. Often we have two classes that work off of each other or the, a set of classes that work together to accomplish a task. And for that we do what are called integration tests. Look, each of those classes may have been done perfectly reasonably but they don't play together nicely because they have different assumptions. Each assumes the other takes care of certain error checking, certain responsibilities. Each has to work with the other to accomplish a task, and if it has a different understanding of what zero means in terms of the possibilities, they're not gonna play together nicely. So you need to often test, do these classes play together nicely? 
going up from there, we have something called a system test. Now, you'll notice system tests are across from use cases. So with system tests, basically we're making sure that the user can go through common use cases and the system will deliver on those use cases. So it's, it's often focused on sort of user actions, sometimes through the UI, sometimes not through the UI, but the type of thing that the user would do through the UI on, on, on the system. So uh, I'll come back to that distinction in a second. But the idea here is the system tests are putting the system through its paces for some use case mm -hmm. to make sure that use case works. Now, I said earlier, that doesn't have to be through the UI. How could you, given that the user works through the UI, how could you create a system test that's not through the UI? Anyone? Um, you could test the actions that go into doing a certain use case Precisely. from the UI? Precisely. So when I click in the UI, or I pull a drop down and I say next, or what have you, um, I uh, submit a form. Things happen, right? I mean, there's, there's what's in the UI, but there's what goes on behind the UI in the model to make that possible, right? The model undertakes actions. The user says delete, and it deletes a thing. So what system tests typically will do will either work through the UI, or if they're not working through the UI, uh, and there's good reasons to sometimes not work through the UI, they will just make those calls themselves to the underlying methods, right? They'll make a call to delete this thing directly. It's the same call that would have been made if the user had selected something and said delete, but it will call that directly. Now, why would you want to create a system test that's not through the UI? Given that we, we have frameworks on web apps, it's something like Selenium, for example, or Water. These are systems that drive the browser. You're going to have Android testing frameworks and iOS uh, frameworks that can operate through the UI there. Given that we have these things that operate through a UI, why would we write system tests that don't operate through the UI? To test things not related to the UI itself. Good. I like that. So maybe it's a setup of the system or something like that, or, or you know, and, and associated with the installation or something. So that's good. Sometimes there aren't UI ways of doing things. There's uh, administrative things that have to be done which are not directly called control from the app. They have to do with the back end, integrating with the app or what have you. Okay, so that's fair enough. Why, why else might we not want to do things with the UI? The UI is not finished yet. Good. The UI is not done yet. And in general, Austin, so I like Austin's comment there a lot. In general, if I had to rank, let's think of an application in terms of its levels. You have the database level, and you have a model level, and you have a, and you have a level up of the UI. Which of those typically evolves most rapidly over time, or most over time, do you think? It turns out the UI does. Sometimes it's because we have multiple UIs. You can access this thing through a web interface or through a, through a iPhone or through an Android. And, and you've got multiple ways into it. But often it's also being modified through, through technology changes. So a new version of iOS comes out and you have to modify it. Or you know there's new widgets available and you change that. People say, well, I'd like to make this screen nicer to look at by changing this color scheme. The point is the UI evolves. And guess what happens to UI tests sometimes when the UI evolves? Suppose you do a usability test, which you should do as part of the semester, a hallway usability test, get some of your buddies to, to work on it, or get some, some users uh, to, to, to sort of bang on the app. Suppose they make a change that splits you know, a screen um, into two different screens. You have to go from one to the other with the next button, with a, with a link or whatever. What do you think happens to UI tests when you do that? They break. They break. <laughs> they gotta be changed. So one of the problems of UI-based testing is typically they break with sizable changes in UI. 
Now, you folks don't know how much you're being spared. Because 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they would break with the most minute changes that you want, like the exact pixel location of a button. You, you know, you move it slightly to the left, the test would break. These days, it's much better than that, but they still break. If, if you have two screens instead of one, you know, the UI test has to be modified. When I say break, I mean it has to be modified, it has to be fixed. And so, if you have system tests that just call the underlying logic, they're not going to break if you modify the UI. You know, just because in the UI, these two things are on separate screens doesn't mean the underlying logic will have to be changing, okay? So, System tests are often through the UI, and I'll expect to see some of that. But often they are not through the UI, and I'll expect to see some of that. They're automated on that. Those are both automated tests, through the UI and not through the UI. What other types of system tests are there besides automated tests? Um, manual tests. Manual tests. This is. This is the province of well-spoken, Jesse, testers, testers such as yourself. Um, you'll be running lots of system tests. And in fact, you folks should get together at least once, multiple times during the semester to have what's called a bug party. And you basically compete to see who can find errors with the system, and sometimes you can rope others into it. And it's a great way to test the system's integrity and to estimate the number of undiagnosed bugs out there. The final thing, which I'm not going to emphasize as much during the course, but there are certain industries where it's A1 important. It's like the name of the game to get paid as a software developer and consultant, is you have what are called acceptance tests. And acceptance tests basically correspond directly to requirements. It's like we require this from the system, and you have tests to verify each of those requirements. Okay, um, so this is the hierarchy of tests, and they correspond to a hierarchy of sort of different types of activity over here on the left hand side, from code low level coding all the way up to requirements. Okay, um, and you're going to have your corresponding tests, and in general. Changes up here are going to ripple down to changes in all these areas, which will ripple up to changes in the test. This is one of the reasons requirements are so key and why we're going to be talking about it um, for much of today. Okay, so this is the V model of testing. Um, okay, uh, I, I hit on most of those things. Um, uh, I noted the need for non functional tests. In your case, for this semester, this is going to be less of a key thing, but you want to make sure that if you have 10 people using the app, that it still works pretty well. It doesn't grind to a halt, right? And there's a difference between stress testing and load testing. Stress testing is you test it under tight memory conditions, tight disk space, uh, low, low speed net. So on load is you have a large number of people, for example, using it at a time. We'll get back to why that's so important. Okay. Um, uh, you're going to want to use a set of testing tools. And I've sent you, just in the past day, some notes this morning and posted some links to the Moodle site about test tools. Jest, Mocha, Chai, Istanbul, Enzyme. These are used with React Native to conduct testing. And they have their different roles. Synon is another. Synon is for test hooks to increase testability. You may have, may have remembered me mentioning uh, testability here, test hooks. It allows you to spy on what's going on in a Java object. It allows you to put in these, these uh, hooks, which will allow you to, to call off to things and allow you to do mocking. Some of, some of the others, uh, like Jest and Mocha, are more general. Um, Istanbul, another thing I didn't emphasize last time, but I want to, something called coverage testing for the app as a whole. Anyone know what I mean by coverage? What do I mean by coverage testing of the application? That each line or each 
method or however you're wanting to measure it is tested? Exactly, Austin. Exactly. So the idea here, however you want to measure it, and we'll get back to different ways of measuring it, but basically these tools like Istanbul allow you to basically say how much of the application has been reached when I conduct a set of tests. Do you think more is good or less is good? Do you want more or less? You want more. more. Yeah, you want to reach a lot of things. So, so why? If I say I've only reached 50% versus 100%, why might I be concerned about that? Because you're only testing half the system? Yeah, and because in the rest of the half, there could be lots of bugs. I don't know about yeah. So Istanbul actually lets you run a set of tests and say, how much of the system have we, have we reached? Which is pretty nice, it's pretty sweet. Now I'll tell you, it's hard to get above 80 or 90 percent. Sometimes it can be hard to put in place conditions that will get you there. And that's where peer reviews can be particularly helpful. And that's where test hooks can be particularly helpful. Classic example of a test hook are recreating error conditions. You want to test if the app is secure on it. Okay, so you want to test is your app secure when you go offline. One way to do that is to go offline to actually disable your Wi-Fi or something like that. It's a little bit of a pain. Wouldn't it be nice if you could test the app under offline conditions without actually forcing the phone to go offline? You just see if the app is stable when it thinks it's offline. And a test hook could accomplish that. In other contexts, not yours so much, but you know, does the app, well, yeah, sure, for yours, maybe does the app work well when there's no more space on the device? On a, on a desktop app, it might be, how if the disk experiences errors? You don't want to have to go take a hammer and bang your disk and say, okay, let's see if the app registers an error, because now we have an error on the disk. You want to destroy your disks. Instead, you have these hooks, which basically say, hey, Act as if you think the network's disrupted so I can see how you behave. And then you see, does it behave in a reasonable way? Does that make sense? It allows for more nimble testing. It allows for automated testing. You don't want to be sitting with your app, you know, every time the automated test is going to run, you have to disconnect it from the web. That's, that's for the birds, disconnected from Wi-Fi. You want it to be automated. Okay, but the other way to spot things that are hard to reach Peer reviews. And peer reviews we started talking about last time. They're more efficient than testing, and they can find more bugs than testing. They find a greater, larger set of bugs, and they can find them more efficiently per human hour. In other words, hours put into peer review, 10 hours put into peer review, yield more found bugs than 10 hours put into testing. It's a pretty good recommendation. That's particularly for inspections, okay? They really easily pay for themselves. The time spent on this will spare you a lot more time while well, doing what? Okay, so if we find bugs in peer review, what does that spare us time? Um, running tests. Good. Running more rounds of testing, because each time we find bugs and those get fixed, we have to run another round. We have to run another round. What else does it spare time for? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a key point. This is one of the most important points. I hope all five of you get, get it easily on the final exam, because it's almost certainly to be there. Okay, get those fingers ready. Okay, so testing. Oh, man. It's okay. I, I often travel with pens. Um, so testing, ladies and gentlemen, when I try, when I go and I test a system, what do I, what does it give me? What does it tell me? Like what, suppose something goes wrong. What, how do I know something goes wrong? Well, a test fails, right? Mm -hmm. Do I know where the bug is that caused that test to fail? Uh, no, you have an idea of where the bug is. You have an idea of where the bug is, perhaps. And what do you have to do to find where the bug is? 
Uh, you have to look through the code to find a possible. Yeah, what do we call that process? In debugging. Debugging. So, testing, bummer, um, not today. Testing gives us, I'll just go get my, uh, so, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Okay, I can do that with my own. Testing, okay. Um, Testing gives you the ability to locate failures of the system. By a failure, I mean horrible. Uh, it allows you to locate things where it seems to be going wrong. And then there's a long process called debugging. Sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short. Often it's not short, and we have to go try to find the bug. I don't know about you. I mean, you folks have done a fair bit of debugging by this point in your history. What's the longest bug it ever took you to find? Ooh, it took us like two days. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually longer. It took us like two weeks. There's, there's like five of us working on that. Yeah, there was once like, it took a while. Yeah. So that's not a short thing. It's taken me, thank you so much. I yeah. really appreciate it. room on the other side. Okay, awesome. Okay, they'll, they'll come back and take it from here. Okay, so testing font gives you failures which is sometimes caused, followed by days, hours, days, or weeks of debugging to find the bug. Peer review, which we're talking about here, finds the underlying fault. Meaning, the debugging step is typically, not, is, is typically left out. You find, oh, that's a problem. Because you're looking at the code. You're saying, oh, we don't handle that case. So it's much more efficient because you cut out the debugging. You cut out the need to debug. You often see more directly what the underlying problem is. Okay? I also argued last time in the closing minutes, it's much more flexible than testing because you, you can conduct it way before the actual code is available. Testing waits for the code. Peer review can be performed on lots of non-code things. Why don't you mention a few again? Make sure it's some kind. Um, risk analysis. Good. Um, requirements document. Um, tests and test cases. Um, so it itself. Awesome. Um, Design docs is another is another type of thing where you, so the architecture of the system or you know how these classes will work together. You're trying to think that through. What what the responsibilities are. Okay. So uh, UI design, right? Um, uh, another another important one. You did that last time, right? I think uh, Ikram, you had you had a, a mock-up of it or something that yeah. you were working with. That's a great thing to do a peer review on. Um, okay, and peer reviews, unlike testing, they they have a lot of other benefits that testing does not. They spread knowledge around the team. Many people attend a peer review, say an inspection. They learn about the system. They learn how it works. Why could that be useful? Why is it useful to learn about the system? Because more people who know about the system can work on it in case of something happening. Yeah. So in software engineering, if you go and you talk with companies around town, not infrequently the phrase will come up about talking about our bus number for a project. What is a bus number for a project? Anyone know? I actually learned yesterday that how close many people have to leave before they have known knowledge. Yeah, exactly. How many people would have to get hit by a bus before they were in really serious trouble? Now, the, the you know it's a semi-joking reference to being hit by a bus, but the point is, if someone were suddenly taken out for an unexpected reason, would the project be in trouble? Do you want that number to be high or low? You want it to be as high as possible. You want it to be as high as possible because, <laughs> because if it's one, you're host if that if if a person leaves, right? And being hit by a bus is just one way a person may leave. What's another way they may leave? Um, illness. Illness. Good. They get another job. At one point in Silicon Valley in the U.S., the average time of people at their jobs was something like six months. You actually look how long, if you surveyed people, how long have you been there? It's, it's six months at that point. 
And the point is people leave. People, and often some of the most knowledgeable people leave because they're, you know, people try to lure them away in some cases. And you, you want to spread knowledge around. And peer reviews do this because you get a bunch of people around the table, five people, six people, looking at an artifact, they learn about how that works. They learn how it relates to the other things in the system. And they come away with an understanding of that part of the system. So if the person who wrote it is no longer available, at least there's a bunch of people who know basically how it works. And it spreads knowledge not only about the pieces of the system, but the code base, standards, coding styles. You say, oh, you know, we really need to improve that. The, the naming of these variables or of these functions, etc. Um, and it can also help newcomers learn more quickly, come up to speed on the system. So there's a lot of points at which people review. This is from Weger's book on peer reviews, which I'd recommend, um, at different parts of the system. Okay. Now, there's a set of different types of reviews. I had mentioned them here, and they differ a lot. At the far side of this is the most formal, and this is the one that's very known to be efficient, more efficient than testing, and more capable than testing finding bugs. I've shown here how they differ from one another. Inspection is up here at the top. It requires planning. You gotta plan for a meeting. Prep ahead of time. People review what's circulated beforehand. You actually, you actually meet, you, you correct, things after it and there's verification of it being corrected. By, by contrast, some of these others are much more informal. I would like you to do as many as possible the informal ones and you will be required to do at least one inspection. Okay? Um, each person has to do go through at least one inspection as the with their artifact being inspected. Um, I'm not going to be super picky about the design, but the basic idea here is that you have for inspections a couple of people who are who are led by someone. There's a set of readers, and it's typically smaller chunks of material, enough to be done in about two hours. And there's a recorder who records what's found, and uh, some documentation of what is found, uh, defects that that are recorded or suggestions. And, and then some follow-up associated with it. By contrast, I'd encourage you to do peer desk checks a lot. This is basically you have some product, you show it to someone else on the team and say, what do you think? You know, uh, give me some feedback on this. Uh, this is what I was thinking um, for this code. Do you see any problems? Who might you give that to? That would be a useful person to give it to. Well, in a larger team, it might be someone who wrote a interfacing component. So their component calls yours, or your component calls theirs. And you want to make sure that you're in sync with understanding about how to deal with them. So this whole issue of um, like the person being inspected will often invite or ask to help review authors of related parts of the system. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, let's, let's go back here. Um, okay, so so they'll draw in people with certain knowledge. In this size of team, it's less of an issue. Um, okay. uh, so I think I'll um, leave it uh, there, other than to say there's various roles in an inspection. Um, often in a true formal inspection, there's someone other than the author who presents the code or, or artifact requirements document, I'm not going to enforce that. It's more like a walkthrough at a technical level. You can present your own materials. Okay, I'm not going to require someone else does. But there are inspectors who will be critiquing that. And in our class, we'll typically have readers and inspectors be the same. I'm going to want to be able to come to your inspections and see, see them in progress. I want to be able to give comments on them. I've done this for other years. Okay. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. So peer reviews are one of the most important things for you to plan on in the context of uh, this class to improve quality. They should be going on at an informal level, 
ad hoc desk checks, what do you think? Pair programming or, or pair testing, uh, informal walkthroughs, all the way to the most formal in the way of, uh, of inspections. Okay, I'd like to see that um, used throughout the term, used early, used often. Okay, any questions about peer reviews before I go into requirements? Questions? Okay. Um, I would urge you get started in peer reviews as soon as possible. Okay. Um, spreads knowledge, spreads understanding of standards, gives a sense of where we're at right now. Sometimes it, it can help make other people's work easier because they have the knowledge to do it. And it can find quality issues. Okay? Okay. So that's best practices. I'm going to stop those slides now. And I'm going to continue over to a discussion of requirements. Okay? Um, certainly, good requirements gathering and requirements gathering along some tips that I'm going to be talking about constitute another area where best practices are really valuable. So, what is a requirement? Well, you tell me, what's a requirement? Something that the stakeholder wants the a project to perform. Good, good. So, slightly more formally, I like your definition on it. It's a criteria that must be satisfied for the project to be viewed as a success by the requirement. Right? Um, often, there's some problem, some gap between what they have now and could have that gets addressed by this by this requirement. And requirements gathering or elicitation uh, was defined by Jerry Weinberger. It's, it's an attempt to, to discover what product is desired by people. I mean, you're, you're trying to figure out what is really wanted here. And one of the things I'll emphasize again, and I emphasized it before in the cavernous room, but I'll emphasize it again here, is that requirements gathering is not a process of merely sitting back and listening to the stakeholders to tell you what they want. Why not? Why isn't it just that? It does involve that, for sure. But why is, not, why is it not merely reduced to that? Just Why is it not merely just that? Because you might have to clarify what they mean. Because they don't, don't have any, uh, <coughs> mo most often they don't have any technical knowledge about what is required. And so okay. you have to be able to levy that with what you need for mm -hmm. them to get the optimal thing okay. for their project. That's right. So, so they don't know what's possible. You don't know kind of what the problem is or the need. And you got to come to a kind of common understanding on this. Because sometimes they won't request something because they think it's out of the question because it would be way too hard. And it turns out it's pretty straightforward. On the other hand, sometimes they'll assume you know something because it's so obvious. They won't even mention it. It's so obvious to them. They live and breathe it. They're just, you know, it's like for you, you know that. If you, if you want to get an app on your Android phone, you go to a different place than for an iOS device. Or you can't run an app on your Android phone on your, on your laptop. You just, no, I mean, um, or you know, you know, Wi-Fi is slower than Ethernet. But you often don't think to, think, to, to mention it. And let me tell you one of the most painful realizations about requirements. A stakeholder may not mention something, the stakeholder you're talking with, the client, may not mention something for one of two very different reasons. One is it's not important to them. They don't really care about it that much. It's not in their priorities. Another is it's so central to their priorities and their way of thinking about it, they don't even think to mention it because they, they assume, you, of course you know that. Of course you know that. Of course, data on medical related information has to be encrypted or, you know, of course we don't want more than one person sharing this information or what have you. Um, 
And those are two things which lead to not being mentioned, but they're very different in their implications. One, yeah, you got to pick up and you got to nail it and you're out for it to be viewed as successful. The other, they're not mentioned because it's not a priority. You don't want to do it. And you got to distinguish between these things. So why this lecture? Because you'll need to understand requirements. You'll need to elicit them. You'll need to bring them out. It's not gathering requirements in a kind of, in a way of, um, of kind of, a, you know, picking berries or something. You actually need to, to go and draw them out of people. And you need to have a dialogue with them. There's another thing too, I, won't, I haven't emphasized, but because I'm hitting these quickly, I'll, I'll just mention it. Another reason you don't just go and listen as the stakeholder tells you everything you want to do is because they, they have trouble imagining things. I told this to you also in that other room. They have trouble imagining things. They don't know, they have trouble imagining what's possible because you folks, are day to day living and breathing this technology and they're not. So they have trouble imagining what this could look like. Their experience with applications is more constrained than yours. So they won't think of something just because it's so outside their experience or they can't envision it. And often by showing them something, you know, by saying this, you know, it's got what I got, they'll say, oh, um, yeah, well, actually what I wanted was something different. It takes that step of actually implementing it or having a prototype to draw this out. This is one of the reasons prototypes are so good. Okay, um, so I want to give some tips for eliciting these requirements reliably. So you can go to Dr. Wapa and have a greater chance of coming away with what you what is needed for it to be a successful project, which is not what he's just going to immediately write down or, or say. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, this will help lessen the risk that late in the game you'll be asked to make some big change. So unstable requirements are the number one or number two reason for project failures in software engineering. Um, and finding things earlier saves time in a way that's exponential over time. So, so IBM, I think it was, that did this study of, okay, if you find a defect later in the game or earlier in the game, what's the cost? And what they found is if you consider requirements cost of one, you know, late in the game, like at the phase of acceptance testing, finding something, it's 50 or more, it can be 50 or more times as expensive to find it. Finding it early, saves a huge amount of effort. Why? It's not just effort too, it's time. Why? Because all the work you've done to do something yeah. that you didn't need to do is wasted. Exactly. You end up throwing away design, code, tests, test matri parts of test matrices. You end up throwing away a lot and having to redo it. And that takes time too. So often, the stakeholders less happy because it's taking longer to deliver the functionality they want because you found it late in the game. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so in this context, turns out, remember we talked in the very first day, we talked about the Iron Triangle, which had to do with time, value delivered, or quality, and cost. And it turns out requirements affect all of those. They, they help with all those. Getting, getting good requirements helps lower the time, lower the cost, and improve the value offered. After all, you give them something they want, not something you thought they want, but it was a misunderstanding. Okay. Um, so what are some common problems with requirement statements? What could be wrong with a requirement statement? What, what other things? I flashed it up there for a moment. You're welcome to mention anything on there. You might have seen. But what things, if, if I write down requirements based on a single meeting with Dr. Waba, maybe, maybe um, you could have me go meet with Dr. Waba and you write down a set of requirements. What, what could go wrong? What, what, what could some problems be with those requirement statements? Uh, vague or uncertain requirements? Okay, yeah, ambiguous, so they're uncertain. They're, it's not clear what's 
what's meant. Um, and maybe it's because of the terminology is unfamiliar. Maybe it's, it was just so briefly mentioned that it wasn't clear. Um, you know, so, so he says, okay, information about, you know, about the team members associated with the patient is stored for the patient. Does that mean it's stored on the patient's phone? Remember we got into this? Is it on their, is it their, their particular phone? Or is it, is it stored in a way that any device they have could, could get it? Even if he said it's stored on their phone, what does that really mean? I mean, I doubt it means that he's thinking, oh, if it, it's only on their phone. I doubt he's been thinking it that sharper term about it. He just means it's accessible with their phone. But that's totally ambiguous about whether the phone loads it from a from a server or whether it has it sort of only on that phone. That's an example that ties in with something called a, a derived requirement. Ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be these things that the user tells you, and then there's going to be these things that you know have to be the case to deliver on that, that the user's not going to tell you because they don't know that it's needed. You know, you know, okay, if it's, if it's not going to live only on their phone, it's got to live somewhere on a server and you've got to connect to it. <laughs> they don't know that. They don't know that at all. They just want it on the person's phone and they want it on all their devices. They don't know that that means some server and some administrative interface and connections to the server and it needs connectivity or something. Because that's not their job to know it. You're the computer scientist, not them. All they know is they want it on all the devices. And when the person gets a new phone, they want to be able to have it there. That's what, that's the user side, but then there's these derived requirements. Okay, but well what else could go wrong in terms of requirements? So ambiguity is a big one, and there's different aspects of ambiguity. What else could go wrong? Ambitious. Over ambitious. Okay, so there could be some things there that really aren't needed for a successful project, and that are risky, right? Who's going to know that they're risky? Us. Yeah. Do you think the stakeholder knows they're risky? No. Generally not. They don't know how hard things are. Do so you say, oh, we're going to have an AI system that's going to you know, automatically determine who else they're meeting through the voice, their voice. You know, it's, just, it's just going to listen to their voice and it's going to propose, oh, I need your card for this new person. You, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> but they're not going to know that. They're going to say, oh, sounds good. Could you, could you have it automatically recognize multiple languages too? And, you know, uh, so the point is they're not going to know what's hard. Okay, what's another thing that could be a problem with the requirements list? Um, they have different priorities than what Good. they you think should be a priority. Yeah, yeah, so you don't know what priority is. It's a big laundry list, right? 20 items long. What things are more important than others? Why could that be important? Because you could design something with very different priorities and then give it to the stakeholder and they were expecting a totally different, like, basic thing Good. than you gave them. Yeah, they want you to start with A and you're starting with Z. And Z is much less interest to them. And they really want to get basics first, for example. Okay, so that's good. What else could be wrong with the requirements list? Missing requirements? Missing. This is the most deadly type. You go over each requirement, oh, looks good, looks good, not ambiguous, and so on. What's really the worst is it's missing. It should be there and it ain't, right? So it's incomplete. I say conflict here. You don't have as much of that issue, but I tell you, if you have three doctors talking to you, conflict, there could be conflict. I don't necessarily mean that they're at loggerheads, that they're you know, they, they, they dislike each other and are, you know, trying to spitefully screw up the project for each other or whatever. No, it's just that different ones will have different priorities. They'll have different sense of what's needed. One may want a more advanced system. One says, no, let's start really simple. Okay. Um, so a lot of these, okay, another one, and this gets a little bit to Mom's comment. These may, or, these may originate, sometimes ambitious requirements originate with the developers. 
the developer slipped something in there. I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? <laughs> That's what I told them. I told them, don't give them ideas. Yeah, well, exactly. And this happens a lot with developers. It happens with me. I mean, I said, cool, you know, let's, let's, let's do this also. Now, is that what the stakeholder wants? Uh, maybe, maybe they're okay with it. Yeah, sure, if you want to do that also. But it's, it's sometimes not delivering more value for them. And sometimes just, you know, it's, it just seems like a, a bit of fun. Now, you, someone may think it's coming from the stakeholder and that it's really needed, right? Another issue is recall error. What do I mean by recall error? You might remember what they wanted differently than what they actually said. Yeah, exactly. So you write it down after the fact. Two days later, you write it down, and you distort something without meaning to. It's just you get, you get the wrong thing off. Or it's unnecessarily specific. They say they want this. So they say, well, you know, QR code, you scan. Maybe they don't really care about a QR code. Maybe NFC connection will be better, you know. And QR code is this nice little square thing, but maybe it would be fine if you held up your two phones together and they communicated with the NFC and it doesn't require it to take a photo or, you know, deal with the screen, screen being, um, you know, having too much glare on it or something. Maybe they just wanted to communicate who this person is to you. They don't care the mechanism. But they mention QR code because that's all they know. And and it's up to you to say, well, are you really specific about QR code? Are those used right now? Or, you know, would it be okay if we, it, would it be better? Or what do you think about doing this other way? And, and hear what they say. Okay, so I mentioned derived requirements. Most requirements are not user, not coming from the user directly. They, they are implied from the user, but it's not directly clear. Okay, so I say, the, the stakeholder says, I want this x-ray visualization system to run on Oculus. Okay, I know, okay, so, so I'm gonna need to interact with VR controls. There's gonna need to be a way to probably get it into this framework that can be loaded by, by Oculus. Or if I want to do a visualization routine, I can only limit it to hundreds of thousands of data points because that's all the GPU rendering pipeline will support. So there's all these technical needs that, you know, stakeholder says X, and I say, okay, that implies Y, Z, A, B, C, because I know the technologies. They say they want it on Android. I say, okay, so, or a better example yet until recently was I want it on Mac, you know, iOS. Okay, so that means I either write it in Objective-C or I write it in Swift or something like that. And that has implications uh, for it. So the user doesn't care about these directly, typically. They don't understand why it's so needed. Like, why are you talking about data compression algorithms? All I want to do is upload my you know, my x-ray images from my phone to the database. Um, and you know compression is needed because otherwise it's gonna take a while to upload them or to see them, right? Okay, so derived requirements are key. And whose job is it to spot the derived requirements? It's your job. It's not the stakeholder's job. You have to figure out when they have a request that what that means for you. Right, what that means at a technical level. Okay. Now, beyond that distinction, user versus derived, there's another distinction. Is it a functional requirement or a non-functional requirement? Now you may ask, why am I going into this taxonomy of these things? It's not for merely conceptual interest. No, it's it's to get you to think systematically what are we missing? So a functional requirement is like, what are the use cases? What are the, what are the features that it needs to have? What, what jobs is it accomplishing? What, what does it allow the user to do? The use cases. You learned about use cases in 370? 370? 370. Okay, good. Use cases are great. They're great to think about. They often correspond to 
tests that you're going to be creating at a system level or acceptance level, and the things you can walk through with a user. You could say, okay, what are common ways of using the system? What are common scenarios for using the system? They're great. But there's another type of requirement that, again, the stakeholders are not going to be talking with you about generally. Sometimes they will, but generally. And it's something called a non-functional requirement. These are not things about, about features it has. It is other aspects of, a, um, of a, uh, an issue. And I'm, I'm going to uh, skip forward just so you can see some of these. One is performance. Another is security, reliability, the footprint, how, how much memory does it take? Um, how often does it have to be available, your, your website? Is it portable? Does it, need to, does it need to be able to be pretty much the same code base between, between uh, iOS and Android, for example? Um, is it reusable? Is it robust to error? If the, if the connection goes out while the person is scanning in a barcode, is that going to lead their app to crash? That's not a, it's not a feature per se. It has to do with robustness under error conditions, etc. cetera. Um, if, their, if their phone goes down after they scanned a couple of these because it runs out of power, they're at the hospital after all. They don't have an easy way to charge it. Their phone dies. Does it lose all the connections they added? The, the stakeholder is not going to tell you these things generally. You can ask about them. And by going through this list, you can ask, OK, you know, is there any performance? Need? You might want to ask the stakeholder about that. How about this robustness? Like what you know, errors, you know, if power goes out on the phone, or, or there's not a Wi-Fi connection available, should that, you know, should that cause problems if the Wi-Fi connection goes down? How about the usability side? Have any of you taken 381? Yeah. So you know something about usability, right? Yeah. Make a system that's easy to use, minimally confusing. Most of the programs you've created are probably for use mostly by people like those in the world to this point. But guess what? Most people in the world are not like the people in the room in, in terms of knowledge of computer computational techniques. They're much less forgiving. They can get confused really easily by the meaning of something. They're much less likely to play around. They're more likely to be turned off and just say, I don't want anything to do with this app. It's, it's confusing. You, so usability is one of these things that you got to be sensitive to, and you might want to talk with the stakeholder about how to make it easy. Okay. Okay, so I made a distinction here between functional requirements and non-functional. I've just talked about non-functional. Let's talk about functional requirements, the features, okay? Um, why are features hard to elicit? Well, one thing, I've mentioned a bunch of reasons. One thing is the client can't envision them easily. You, you, they can't envision the solution. Another is, they can't tell you exactly what they want because they're speaking in their own language. You're speaking in yours. They're, they're talking about you know, the clinical consults and the allied health professionals involved and, uh, and the fact that you've got an attending there who needs uh, access to the resources uh, from the, the, the nursing desk. And you're not quite sure what they're talking about a lot of the time. So sometimes when they will mention something, it'll be with specialized terms whose meaning is not, is not clear. They won't be aware of what's feasible. You'll have to tell them what's feasible often. They don't know the logical steps that have to be taken to address it. What has to go before what? You know, they don't, they don't know how apps are built or what needs to be done uh, for that. Um, and they don't understand the technology implications of, you know, the steps that they might want to take. They say, what well, this feature first, you say, well, can't really have that feature until we have these four other features. Or we have to get you to think about a website to you know, list the various staff 
who have QR codes and give information on their QR code. They're, they're not going to know that. So when it comes to functional requirements, you're going to want to think about these things. And you're going to want to try to help them. Meanwhile, you're going to have blinders because you don't understand the domain-specific need. You don't understand how painful it is or the problems now necessarily. Some of you will from being a patient for your app. Um, it's hard for you to envision a solution sometimes. And you can't always understand what they're saying. So you've got to really make this effort to overcome some of these things, to understand what is feasible, what's not feasible, to communicate this, the solution through mock-ups, um, to help them understand why you have to take one step before the other. Even though they may want B before A, you have to do A before B for technical reasons. Does that make sense? Okay. So often functional requirements, um, uh, Uyghurs, um, who also wrote a book on, a really good book on peer reviews, has a book more about software requirements. And um, it's a good book. It's, it's worth uh, thinking about. Um, take a look at it. I have a copy. And it's one of several books he's written on the functional requirements area. But he argues functional requirements can also often be phrased in this way. A particular user should be able to accomplish something, delete, add, modify, change this, what have you, scan in a QR code. To, to what? So do something to something, like scan in a barcode from another, from a healthcare professional. Um, and maybe something about a qualifier, you know, as long as they are connected online or something like that. Or, or as long as that's not a person already in their record. Um, or uh, as long as the, the barcode is visible within a certain distance or what have you. So here, you can often use this to describe requirements. So here, the patron should be able to reorder any meal he had ordered, it could be he or she, had ordered within the previous six months provided that all food items in that order are available on the, on, on the menu for the meal date. That's an example requirement phrased along these lines. And I've given you some others in subsequent slides. Here's a bunch of requirements. Right? Um, uh, and sometimes you will also say conditions. You know, this might be like you're online right now. Um, um, so. See here, until the camera app is either closed by the user, experiences a timeout to the inactivity, the take photo button on the main IFP screen shall remain disabled. Um, uh, or a user indicates search replaces needed, the software responds by prompting the search term and replacement text. The user enters the text and indicates the software is to do a case sensitive search to replace all occurrences. This is more detailed type of requirement involving search functionality, for example. Um, Users shall be required to log into the cafeteria ordered system for all operations except viewing the menu. So in other words, everything else besides viewing the menu should require them to, to log in. So these are some requirements. And I've given you, given you some more, okay? Um, okay, uh, use cases can be useful to discuss with the user. Um, often you envision them before taking down these requirements. What are the sort of needs, the scenarios associated with it? And commonly you have preconditions, postconditions, um, rules for when things apply or what have you. And they can be understood by many clients. That's one of their advantages. So you might want to talk about use cases with the client and use that to build up an understanding of requirements. Use cases are not very good for things that are not user facing, for things that are computationally going on behind the scenes. There's no user to do this. It's rather a set of processes or technical details um, or it's the sole description of functionality. Okay, um, okay let me get to some tips because time is, is a running on. Number one, go with more than one person. So you stay over. There should not be Crumb's job alone, although she should be a key person to interface with the stakeholder. 
have at least two or three others. Why? Um, more ears the better. More ears the better. People may pick up on something someone else didn't. Some people may know certain domain language better than others. They know what's meant because they have a family member who's dealt with the healthcare system or they have a parent who's a nurse or what have you. Um, so having several people there is useful. Memories are less likely to be um, shortchanged by recall issues um, with several people. So per Mohan's comment, more ears are better from multiple perspectives. When you gather something from them, repeat it and ask, this is what I think I heard. Repeat it in your own words. Why not repeat it in their words? Because you don't think in their words. You don't think in Their words may mean something different for them than you think they do. So you repeat it back and you haven't gotten to the heart of the matter that by using this word, you're understanding it differently than them. So you, instead you rephrase it. You rephrase it in your own words. And it's more likely, it's good precisely because it's more likely to bring up an oversight on your part or misunderstanding on your part. That's why it's good. We welcome this critique so that we can arrive at a more firm understanding. Because otherwise, your misunderstanding persists. You just write down their words, but you don't really understand their meaning. So you repeat it. Or you add, and also, you ask the stakeholder to repeat it. In other words, if possible. So could you say that again using other terms we may be more familiar with? And you listen to what they say there. And then you might write it down in your own words and then repeat it back to them. Okay. Um, sounds cumbersome. It's a lot less awkward and cumbersome than throwing out lots of code or, or design documents or tests because they're not needed because you misunderstood later. Um, Okay, requirements documents should evolve. Requirements documents for this class are gonna evolve at least four times for the five deliverables. You're gonna be adding in requirements. You can have a sense of what they want up front, but that sense will be refined because you're gonna be showing things to them, you're gonna be accomplishing some things and not. They're gonna be thinking about it more and they'll come up with a clearer understanding of what they really want. Okay, now, it's very useful to use what's called traceability. To say, okay, this requirement, what is it linked to within the system? What, why do I say a, a requirement might be linked to something in the system? like code or tests or, or reviews or design, features of design. What, why could it be linked to these things? Because the requirement might have implications that affect those yeah. things. Yeah, like the test might be testing something involving this requirement, right? So maybe it's an acceptance test or maybe it's not, maybe it's a system test but it's going through use cases that involve this requirement. That's useful to know. Why is it useful to know that? Forecasting, like to kind of know what you Good. expected of you. Good, yeah, you gotta be thinking about what we need to get in place to capture this new requirement, that's good. What else? What can happen due to misunderstandings with requirements? The wrong person works on the requirement, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'd have to operationalize that, not, not sure. But requirements can change. Right. The user can say, you know, I said that earlier. I said I only want it, to, it only has to stay on their phone, but I reconsidered that. Because one of my colleagues said, you know, they switch some of their patients, you know, come in with one phone and they're given a, a, a better tablet because they're in the hospital for a while, so they're given a better tablet. We really want them to be able to get all their contacts on that device. I didn't think of it, sorry. And those requirements can change. And so knowing what that affects within the system, or even more so if it's like a change in under your understanding of it, can be useful. Because you know what things can be thrown out or have to be uh, updated, right? Prioritize them. 
Prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Talk with the stakeholder which things are highest priority. Now, suppose they have a prioritization of these requirements. One, two, three, four, five. Decreasing priority. Suppose they have, are those the orders you're going to do them in? Not necessarily. Why not? Because one might require number five to yeah. be done. Yeah. And they're not going to know that. Good. What's another reason? So that's an excellent reason. What's another reason? Well, one thing you might want to do is maybe number two, no, requirement two, has some big technical risks associated with it. If you push it off and those risks bite later, you're in trouble. If, if they're going to be a problem, you want to know about them soon. Because it involves interaction of React Native with You know this uh, this uh, uh, really uh, really great uh, visualization technology or what have you, and you want to explore that soon. You want to get that done soon, because if you start building things and then you discover a problem later, you have to rip more things out and throw them away. So better to get it done. So risk is another reason to do certain things sooner. What's another reason to do it sooner? Suppose they besides doing one, two, three, four, five. Well, maybe you can do two, three, four, like within half a day. And one and five take four weeks to do. Good reason to, to say, well, okay, even the priority may be on these. Wouldn't, if we could give you two, three, four sooner, like next week, show it to you. Would that outweigh getting one? And they might say, yeah. Yeah. And you'd have to ask the stakeholder for that. Yes. Right? Yeah, exactly. So you have to. It says like one and like one is more important than all five. That's right. Yeah. And, and even if you say, well, you know, we can do the other four much faster than one and say, no, it's, it's important. We, we do this one first. We need to get the buy in from this other person on the ward and we want to be able to show them that up front to get their buy in then yeah, sure. But it has to be an informed choice. You don't want it to be uh, something where they don't, th they have no option in the game typically, you know, saying, yeah, I'd like that, yeah. So priority is part of it, but ease of implementation is, is a big part. And that's up for you to communicate because they're not gonna know that, right? Um, so, in many projects, it's good to have acceptance tests around requirements. So you have tests that actually confirm this. Um, uh, and you should be thinking about hidden requirements, per Austin's comment. They're, some of the most important requirements are the ones that aren't there yet, <laughs> and you want to know about them. Because they're the ones, again, the stakeholder may be counting on it, and you think that you've bothered even thinking about it. So getting to the bottom of that, and this is something where many ears, just like Moam said, is really useful. Because with many ears, sometimes someone can notice, you know, it's almost as if he's assuming this certain thing. It's almost like he's assuming it's always online or something like that. Or he's assuming that, you know, you can update, you can update these cards and, the, and all the patients will automatically see the updates. And then, only then do you think to ask about it. And, oh, yeah, well, well yeah, I mean, of course. Um, so, so think about these hidden requirements. Like, what is being assumed here? What's not being said? Really value. More people can help with that, okay? Um, uh, right. Um, uh, this says try to avoid saying what won't do. But sometimes having it black and white like saying the system will, will not allow the user to undertake any action when it's offline. You know, um, that just to make sure you're, you've set expectations with the stakeholder, sometimes that can be good to just be very clear about that. Um, if, if you have um, requirements that can be diagrammed out like in a table or something, do that. 
and try to avoid ambiguous words. Try to make it in very basic statements. Try to avoid, um, you know, uh, something like it might do this or 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 may. Um, try to make it clear. Okay, it must do this or it shall do this. Um, and try to avoid words that have multiple meanings for them versus you. It's going to take a bit of time to find that. It's going to take some sniffing, but it's pretty important. Um, uh, right. Now, you probably should have a requirements change process. The good thing is, by doing this, so I'm going to, I'm going to say, because you're doing this in an agile manner, an incremental manner, Requirements changes are much less of a problem than they would have been for systems that were built traditionally in the so-called waterfall model, where maybe you'd be working on it for a year before it came out. Why, is, why are requirements changes so much more problematic if, if you're working on something for a year before you're done versus if you're iterating every two to three weeks? Because it's harder to steer changes on a, on a larger piece of, of time of work. Than a small piece. That's one good reason. Yeah, it's um, you're you're setting your course for you know it's like you're I was gonna say you're on the Titanic, going from Liverpool to New York or something, but um, that that wouldn't be a good good one. But you're you're on a long range you know ship journey, and suddenly they say okay you've got to go instead, you know to instead of going to North America you're going to Africa. You know turning. <laughs> Turning around in that is it, it's hard. You've got all this stuff, you know, counting on, on, on going there. You're in the middle of the large scale development of all these different features, and suddenly you've got all these headaches. So that's one reason. What's another reason? If you're working on this for a year, what's another reason that requirements changes might be more of an issue? Technology updates. Yeah, there's a lot more going on in a year, technology wise, user needs wise, user position wise. I mean, um, different users come in, the user's organization. A year ago and now, Mark Wapa's organization is like night and day change because they merged. The, the health regions merged into the health authority. And he wouldn't have necessarily been in this position next last year, and now he is. And people change positions, who's speaking for the project is different. It's a lot more chance it's gonna be a risk. Whereas with an agile, that it's going to change sometime during the project between when it's planned and the deliverable. Every two to three weeks, you meet every two to three weeks, they have a different need, request it for the next deliverable, worst case, a modification, or it's just a need that hasn't been expressed yet. You haven't done it yet. Your plans change for the next liberal. You thought you're going to do A. You're actually going to do A prime, a variant of A, or change to A. Fine. You haven't added it yet. You haven't built the app around it yet. You added it. Okay. Um, so, requirements change process. If you get a request, this is the V. Uh, the, if you uh, the V uh, model of testing. If you get a request from Mark Wabha, one of you gets a request. Let's suppose eChrome gets a request. Or maybe Mark mentions at a requirements meeting or a meeting he wants to do something different. You should have a way of recording that and discussing it. Okay, um, yeah. How long are the meetings usually? With the stakeholder? Yeah. One to two hours. So it takes one to two hours. Yeah. It's not like a 15, 20 minute thing. It's really hard to do for 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah, no, I'm expecting yeah. it to like. No, uh, to like later in the here. semester, you could probably do make do with a half an hour. Because you just show. You're just showing the update and saying, we're thinking, based on what you said in the past, we're thinking this thing will be next. We couldn't do it for this deliverable, but we're thinking for the next one. What do you think? Um, and see what he says and, and get that. But yeah, normally later in the semester, it's less. Up front, you're going to be learning his language some. You're going to be learning what his thoughts are. And you want to be keep your eye out for these missing requirements yeah i'm just like wondering because if we ask him to like free out of time yeah you tell him one to two hours i would say let's give, you could say you could do it in an hour be ideal if you could get 90 minutes or two hours but okay. you recognize that may not be possible maybe an hour um and uh and see what he says
Okay, so I've listed here sources of error, which I'm not going to go through in detail because I've mentioned many many of them. Missed ambiguity, a missing requirement, right? Um, uh, someone misheard the statement. Many ears help recall misrecall the statement. Many brains help. Um, uh, sometimes people completely neglect the tacit requirements, security, getting clear what the security implications are. Um, uh, how many users have to be able to handle this? Is this like a million users at the same time? Probably not. Um, uh, integration with existing systems. Ask about these things. These are not obvious. They may be in the background for him. Oh, of, of course we want this to integrate with the electronic health record. What? You know. Um, that would be not desirable. It's better to unearth these things early. Um, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay. I think, um, yeah, restating the problem statement, emphasizing different words in it. Um, be good. You might even list definitions of, of keywords. Okay. That's all for today. Like, other days, except for when the tutorials, I always have office hours after this, if any of you want to talk. Um, uh, but otherwise, I will be looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday, and I'll be looking for you to give the infrastructure presentation on the tutorial on Tuesday. Remember that. So that re will require you, just like countless projects have in past versions of this course, to dig into what's available in the technology, understand how the GitHub setup is going to be used for that, work on setting up a GitHub pipeline, um, get, you know, evaluating is Jest or Mocha a better fit, for example, for you, and really getting clear on what the different components of this course are. That's, that's an important responsibility. I've given you some pointers. I've given you a bunch of links on the Moodle site, and I'd like to for you to work towards a plan for next Tuesday so I can give you feedback, okay? And we'll be doing that here as well. Thank you very much.